Well, it's because regulation is boring to people. Like, it's not a fun, like, dinner party topic, but it's so important. It's like the, and people talk about, you know, small business being the backbone of our economy. I actually think regulation is like the backbone of our economy, good or bad. Sometimes you have a bad back. Like, I think that there's a lot that needs to be worked on here, and I wish that we're more, there were more people in the tech space working on the regulatory problems. Hey, Malka. Welcome to American Optimist. Thanks for being on the show. So excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you about some solutions for government right now. I know you're building nonprofits and for-profits trying to fix government problems, trying to make the regulatory state work better. But first, I want to hear a little bit about you. So, so where did you grow up, Malika? I grew up in a very bucolic part of Arkansas um, in the northwest part of the state. And your parents came to Arkansas from Afghanistan. Yeah, I'm the daughter of um, Afghan immigrants, um, and they're both educators now in the state of Arkansas. Um, and, you know, I grew up with a very interesting background being Afghan first generation in a very conservative state, but I think it was healthy. And, and, and I understand in high school you played the bassoon? <laughs> I did. I played bassoon in high school through college and after college. Um, I was playing, like, professionally for the last 10 years before kind of coming to San Francisco and figuring out that I wanted to work in tech. Um, but that was sort of my first passion. And my second passion was political philosophy, which is, you know, how I met Clay and then came to San Francisco and started working on archive. So political philosophy, you were involved in the, with the Institute for Justice. Yeah, I worked at the Institute for Justice, which is a civil liberties law firm um, based in D.C. And they litigate um, a lot of administrative regulation problems, um, a lot of property right uh, cases as well. And that's when I really became ena enamored with like figuring out how we can make the administrative state work better because I was on the research side um, at the law firm, like studying and I, you know, basically sending tons of FOIA requests to government agencies. What's a, what's a FOIA request? A FOIA request, FOIA is F-O-I-A, Freedom of Information Act. It's a federal law that requires, or that requires agencies to respond to the public um, whenever the public asks for information from them. So it requires agencies to like keep certain data, letters, records on hand and make them available upon request. Um, FOIA is a really powerful tool. It's used a lot by journalists and a lot by law firms. Um, and it's, it's sometimes abused, but uh, agencies generally respond. What, what, was there anything about your upbringing in Arkansas that, that made you annoyed at the regulatory state or the administrative state or made you passionate about this? I mean, I don't think it was Arkansas per se. It was probably just like my home environment. My parents are like, you know, they, they escaped like uh, the, the Soviet regime in Afghanistan and uh, are always really skeptical of authority. So I think that was kind of like bred into me as a child. And what are the problems with the administrative state? Why, why is that an issue in America? So the administrative state refers to um, the sort of like morass of regulatory agencies that are unelected and really unaccountable to most people. Um, and the, the shift in power to the regulatory state really happened in like um, the later 1900s, like 80s, 90s, um, where the legislature kind of gave away some of their power to these agencies, um, and the agencies are now creating and enforcing regulations. It's kind of this closed circuit. Um, so, you know, let's say Congress uh, passes a bill saying, like, we want cleaner air. They, like, throw it over the fence to um, the EPA or regulatory agency, and the EPA is then responsible for writing the regulation that makes that so, and also enforcing it, and also adjudicating in administrative courts um, any cases that come up. So, so, so they get to write the rules, and they get to be the judge, basically. Yeah, yeah, and the enforcer. So it uh, creates a lot of information asymmetry, and it's a very broken feedback loop between the regulator and the regulated community. It's interesting because there, in the Constitution of the U.S., you're supposed to have government that's checked everywhere, and so it sounds basically like this administrative state doesn't really have good checks on it's it. It's totally unchecked, and it's also very susceptible to uh, special interest and you know political influence. So big companies might capture these regulators. Big companies can, and they definitely have an advantage. Um, but smaller companies, innovative startups, things like that, don't really have as as much say there. And, you know, I, I, saw, I, I, saw, I saw one study you were citing earlier that was saying that the, the economy was growing a lot more slowly because of these regulations. How, how many regulations are there usually in a state? Uh, geez, in the state level, there are usually several hundred thousand. At uh, the federal level, there are like over a million. Um, the, the regulations are also like not kept up to date. And that's, you know, before we started Esper, we started Argai, which was a nonprofit focused on regulatory reform that was happening at the state and federal level. Uh, and at Argive, we really 
realize that the regulatory reform falls into two camps. One is issue specific and one is process specific. So issue specific would be like, you know, we want to work on licensing reciprocity or cottage. What's licensing laws. reciprocity? Licensing reciprocity. So right now across the U.S. and every state has a different sort of schema for this. Um, if you want to be a nurse practitioner or a plumber or, you know, any of these sort of vocational professions, you have to go through some sort of licensing process. And the requirements for um, being a nurse practitioner in Tennessee are going to be very different from those in Arizona or California. So licensing is one type of regulation mm -hmm. and the regulations are different in every state. Yeah. And so something like rep reciprocity allows the states to be more harmonized and work together. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's like an issue specific reform, but the reform that we're more interested in is kind of why we created Esper um, is process specific reform. It's like decidedly unsexy, but basically it's the process or the rules through, through which regulations are made. Um, and right now that's largely um, governed by Administrative Procedures Act at the state and federal level um, that requires agencies to go through certain uh, steps as they create regulation, but that process, those steps right now are not really um, like fluid and they don't make a lot of sense. They don't work in, in harmony with markets. And we wanted to create an operating system at Esper where we are sort of the source of truth and the system of record for where regulations and policy is being made um, so that we can work on improving that feedback loop between the regulator and the regulated community. Another crazy statistic I saw is the Federal Register. It was grown just massively over the last five decades. What's the Federal Register? Again? So the Federal Register um, is sort of like the book of regulations of the federal government. So there's a book where they write all the regulations in it and it used to be like 10 or 20,000 pages long and now it's, it's 185,000 pages yeah, long. Yeah, it's grown a lot. And what's really fascinating is uh, the federal government has introduced a lot of regulatory reform during that time period aimed at like keeping the number of regulations low, but because they haven't really changed process, they've just like added more paperwork and more people to it. Um, the, the regulations like actually continue to grow. So they're throwing people at it, but they need to throw technology and innovation at it and, mm -hmm. and, and data at it. Yeah, yeah. And they have to, you know, take things away from the regulators basically. and. They, they're like they don't have the systems in, in place to do that. And and I remember one one study we, we I was looking at it said the economy would be like thirty percent bigger in the last forty years if they'd gotten this right. What what why is that? Is it, is it true to actually have a much bigger economy if these things were were done better? Oh yeah. So this is a, a cool paper that came out um, a few years ago from the Mercatus Center, and basically it looked at the level of regulation, the cumulative cost of regulation from the nineteen eighties to present day, and they estimated that you know the economy has slowed around 0.8 annually um, because of these sort of stacking regulations. But are these regulations saving lives and making people better off or, or, or what's what's the trade-off here? I don't know and the agencies don't know. That's the issue. So right now uh, regulatory agencies they'll pass you know an occupational licensing regulation in 2000 and then they'll pass a new one in 2015 and a new one in 2020 and they begin to stack on top of each other. They're not really like grooming or pruning the regulations. So this is not like sophisticated data-driven process where they're mapping out the states doing one thing, the states doing one thing, what's working better. They, they, don't, they don't have the it's data. It's super back of napkin. Uh, math right now, the, they're not talking to each other. It's very siloed uh, and there's a lot of data interoperability problems and that's why Esper is you know, here to be that operating system where we can open up data, show innovation where it's happening and also call out problems. So you're letting people compare between the states what's happening how, how do you do that oh it's cool so basically when we started Esper we invested a ton of time into building up this like database and ontology of regulations across the federal state in Canada and we've applied some some cool NLP and other you know tech things uh, to analyze the data and find similarities contradictions duplication um, across the state and federal level so if we have a new client in Tennessee um, and they want to be the best you know agency for solar energy, they can compare their solar energy regulations to the entire landscape of solar energy regs across the U.S. and figure out where they can be more competitive. So it, it sort of like plays, it gamifies like the regulatory system a little bit because actually states are pretty competitive and they want to be the best. I actually do believe there are good intentions behind sort of all of this complexity. Um, you need to give them tools and resources to so actually do it. the idea is to have the regulations that maximize safety, that maximize all the things they want while not breaking growth and breaking the industries. So. Yeah, the, the regulatory state needs to work in harmony with markets, not against it. And I think, you know, that study that we just talked about um, really shows and illuminates that um, regulation can stifle innovation, it can stifle growth. Well, it's a shocking amount of money. I think it's, it's if, if it was that much bigger, we'd have $4 trillion $4 more trillion. money, yeah. right? Which is, what that is, like $13,000 per person You're fast in the with economy. Math. Yeah, exactly. 
That's a lot. And that's, so the average person would be thirteen thousand dollars richer. Is that? I mean, is that going to the average person? Is this just the rich people taking taking stuff? Like like is like is regulation? I think there's a view in our country by some people the regulations are just stopping rich people from like stealing all this stuff. Like like what's what are some of the other examples? I think of, actually of like the rich people have the resources to game the regulatory system and get ahead. Um, whereas the small people are like, the smaller businesses. It's the people who can't afford all the armies it's the people of lawyers. That can't hand, yeah, exactly. Like they don't have a regulatory compliance team. Um, maybe they don't even know about certain regulations and it ends up killing their business. So the big, the big, the big guys basically can afford to deal with regulations. They can pay, pay for it. Yeah. And, and, there's, and, and so the idea is to speak up for the small people is what you're doing here. Mm-hmm. What, what, I mean, shouldn't everyone be in favor of this thing? Why, why isn't this something that you could just get everywhere? Like how, how many states is Esper in right now? Ooh, I think we're in about 11 states and then a few federal agencies. That's pretty good. Yeah. And what, 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 why aren't you in all 50 states? Like, what, who, who pushes back on this sort well, of thing? Well, I need more salespeople first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't say that people push back on it per se. I think that, especially in the past two years, even after we started Archive, there's uh, definitely a recognition across both sides of the aisle um, that you know we need to improve regulation, but the language in which they you know s- sort of cloak that intention is different. So. In, in more democratic states, are going to talk about you know regulation needs to be more transparent and uh, you know accessible and equitable things like that. And then they on, like the word equitable. In they really states. like the word equitable, yeah, and, and accessible too. Uh, and then on the you know the right, we'll hear like we need accountable, efficient. Doesn't the right you know? just want to like rip these things up? I mean, yes and no. I think it depends. Uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of you know Republican states have issued executive orders or legislation um, that requires agencies to do retrospective reviews or zero-based regulatory What's budgeting. a retrospective review? A retrospective review, um, which is a mouthful, requires uh, regulatory agencies to do periodic lookbacks on their regulations um, and then decide whether or not they want to keep the regulation on the books or not. And this is introduced in probably like 10 to 15 states right now um, with various levels of success. Uh, it's it requires a lot of work from the agency because agencies have a lot of regulations. Do they have the, do they have the resources to go back and do these reviews? Not really, which is why Esper is created. And also, I, I think... So, so you guys, is that one of the things you do is you have tools to help them do the review Yeah, we better? do it really quickly for them. So like we'll scan their regulation and then show them like, you know, here's areas where your regulation cite laws have been repealed, where they're less competitive with other states. So, so, like so they that. actually cite laws that have already been repealed. Yeah, it's a very bad thing and could other be states other trouble. states you go into and you like scan all of them and you say wow you're enforcing all these things you shouldn't you're not supposed to be enforcing yeah i mean i shouldn't say which states but yes it happens all the time in red states and blue states and you know the federal government it's everywhere it's ubiquitous and so and so, so stepping back there's this view in our society that the the you know the the, the right views the left as just wanting like all these rules that are breaking everything and are nonsense and the left views the right is wanting no rules at all and just so business can do whatever it wants and 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 you you, you seems like you're not on either of those extremes the idea is that the idea is the solution for the regulatory state is to make it data driven and smart and, and to and to review these things with technology that's more and transparent. sophisticated yeah and transparent. We're, we're introducing accountability absolutely but that's that needs to happen. It's how you know our government was designed, and it's gotten a little out of hand in the administrative state. So technology can introduce accountability by making it transparent, showing where there are problems, and also where there are good things. And you're making it more effective, I assume. I assume there's some states where the regulation is not getting done when it's supposed to be getting done, and the big companies are getting around it. And can you can you find that out too? I mean, that's that's like the long term goal. We've done some cool things. So what I think is actually probably the biggest issue right now in the regulatory state. We're working on the process, but. Agencies, you know, write these regulations and then they put them into administration and enforcement. You know, they've written their nurse practitioner regulation. Now they have to actually, you know, collect the licenses, do the test, all of these different things. And they have no data on any of that. So, so they've written it and they're not getting feedback from the real There's world. There's no feedback. Why, why not? I mean, they don't have the tools to do it, but also I don't think they're making themselves vulnerable to do it either. Got it. So it kind of makes a regulator a little bit vulnerable if they have to get data and then say what's working, what's not working. They have to go back and change things. That kind of creates extra work for them. Yeah. Well, that's why I think retrospective reviews uh, aren't as effective as they could be is because whenever agencies are actually looking at their regulations, they don't have, they aren't like presupposing that with any data. They're just like, I think this is working. Let's keep it. It's very interesting because in a free society, in a market, the parts of our society that are run by businesses there's all these dynamic feedback and you're constantly adapting to that feedback. Yeah. Whereas the government is not getting dynamic feedback and, and it just continues to grow because they don't have any reason not to. They just grow and they don't actually hear if it's working or not. 
And it, the state by state thing is really interesting as a solution, right? Because you can say this state's doing one thing, this state's doing one thing. You can actually learn who's doing better. Are there are there lots of cases where it's clear one state's outperforming in a certain area? Yeah, I think it it depends on like the the agency vertical. Like you know, I think that when you say agency vertical, how many agencies are in a state normally? Just trying to give give people a good sense twenty of to this. thirty. Uh, and what's an example yeah. of an agency? Is an it agency environmental would be or like health the or? Department of Transportation, um, DOT. Yeah, okay. or the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal so, level. But 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 these are also in states as well. There's, there's twenty or thirty states, per state. Yeah. And can you give us an example of, are you allowed to give an example of where one was doing better than another one? You can not mention the second state if you don't want to offend them. Yeah, so one one agency that I think is doing super well is the Georgia Insurance Commission. Um, we've worked with them for a few years now and they you know, have dramatic, they didn't have a regulatory process. Like they admitted it, they were vulnerable. So they hadn't built their own process. They hadn't built their own process and they were like, we need to get this under control. Um, and you know, they brought us on board, like started doing uh, all of their regulations in our software, which is the goal. Um, and, and they're becoming sort of a leader in the uh, insure tech uh, space right now. So a lot of insure techs are wanting to work there because the process is clear and they know how to engage with them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are, are, are insure techs able to capture that and take advantage of people though? Or, or how, do you, how do you think about that? I don't, I don't think they're taking advantage of it per se in a bad way. I think they're recognizing like Georgia is doing innovative things and they want to be part of that. Another example would be like in Arizona, they did um, a regulatory sandbox for FinTech a couple of years ago. What's a, what's a regulatory sandbox? It a sounds like a place for little kids to play. It does, and I, I had to like have someone explain it to me too a while back, but basically a sandbox is sort of like um, a boxed off area where uh, companies are invited to come with like less regulations and you know play basically. So, so Arizona, there's less regulations and they're gonna try and see what happens and they're gonna go in and like put in some more rules for the four-year-olds in the sandbox if they're throwing sand in each other's eyes. Exactly, like there's sort of like deadlines, of, okay, like we're gonna give you like three years with less rules. We, it's, it's really like a, by design, a way for the state government to attract more industry. So they attract it, they watch it, are they then put in more rules if things are breaking though, or, or what's, what's the I think idea? the, it's actually way more collaborative and probably the closest we've seen to a healthy feedback loop because uh, the agency is actually talking to the Got company so and the company's talking to them. And they're chatting with them and they're, they're kind of giving them free reign but watching them closely and saying, well, how should we do this? Yeah, sandboxes are cool. And I know that the CFPB at the federal level tried to do something like that. Under should, we just have, should we have a lot more sandboxes for companies? <laughs> Lots of sand. Um, who needs the beach? I, I think uh, yes, and we need to figure out which industries. It's, it's really like states are competitive and they're doing their own thing. So, you know, whereas a financial regulatory sandbox may work in Arizona, that may not be what Tennessee wants to optimize for. So they're going to set up a sandbox for another industry. I guess you have to have really spend a lot of time on these sandboxes. You can't just have like 10 of them in your state. So you can only choose a couple. You should choose usually. a few. It, it's resource intensive, um, but it also makes regular regulators like a lot more thoughtful about how they are going to regulate because they have to choose wisely. They, they, don't, they only have so much time um, to dedicate to regulations in the sandbox. So I want, I want to back up a little bit and talk about what the policymaking life cycle in our country. So we have, obviously, there's the three branches of government. There's the legislators are supposed to be making the policy. The executive branch, which is the governor or the president, is supposed to be with the, with the agencies and carrying it out and enforcing it. And then if it's challenged, there's supposed to be a third branch that you kind of de 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 you know, debate and rule on these things, which is the judiciary, which is the, the judges. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then a lot of people like to see the regulatory state as like a separate fourth thing, but it's actually supposed to be mostly within the executive branch, right? right. And it's supposed to be under their control. And, and so, 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 so what, 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 what are the, what are the steps of a new, there's a new policy? Like where does it start and how yeah. does it work? So we conceptualize the policy life cycle, um, really because we, you know, had our first client in Texas and Kentucky and Tennessee, and we were like, oh, each of these states regulatory process is slightly different. And we need to do like extract themes from that. Why aren't you in Arkansas yet? You know, ask Asa. I would like to be there. All right, all right, sorry, keep going. <laughs> um, we'll come back to it. I'll tell you later. Uh, so basically, the policy life cycle is eight stages. Um, it starts with legislation. So you know, the Congress will pass a law. They throw it over the fence to the regulator, and the regulator is now responsible for like running their process. So um, the second stage. So, so, so the Congress yeah. passes a law and says, "Regulator, it's now now in your your your." You, it's now in it. your court. Okay. Yeah, and like, I I I don't think it should be that way. I think legislators should like have more they you know, should define it they should define it a little more closely it's really loosely defined in law and the regulators go in you know with scissors and pen like they like really like edit it down and like add more uh 
to and what does it mean to add more there's is that what guidance documents are add or, more or? requirements add more language add more guidance um you know because the the legislators pass such vague laws um it's very open to interpretation so there's a law and now they're going to write the regulation on the regulatory side mm-hmm and then, and then if they want to update it, that's what guidance documents are? Or how, how does it work? What guidance do do? documents are interesting. Um, they're kind of like this black hole. So, and also like very legally questionable. So regulation um, has statutory authority. And every regulation has Statutory to, authority means it officially has authority under law to do Under to. law. And every regulation must have that by design. Um, like you can't just have a regulation that doesn't cite a law. You can't, you can't just have a random new regulation. But, yeah. it, but, but, how, but how close does it have to be to the law? Can it be because this thing is kind of obscure or surely related to a law or it has to be like directly from a law or how, or how do we there's decide? a lot of discretion exercise there um so it really depends uh agencies because they're largely unaccountable can take a lot of leash there. you say unaccountable there's there's they're accountable if someone sues them i assume but then they but then they have their own courts they have their own courts exactly um and they also have people that will like protect them if it's in their interest too um so like they're they're pretty unaccountable. I would say like the biggest accountability that agencies have um, is that their budgets are set by the legislature. Um, so they like should do some good things so the legislature will continue to fund their operations. Um, but guidance documents are um, non-regulatory guidance, or guidance, basically like an agency will pass a regulation and the regulation is like so confusing and like complex and like laden with legalese. They'll write a guidance document or like an ancillary document. They're teach you what they actually meant. And like, it's like more in layman's terms of like, here's what we actually meant when we wrote this like, you know, carbon neutral regulation or something like that. Got it. Yeah. And, and then so, so going back, so you have, it passes the law, it goes to the regulator, they raft and write the, pub, the policy. They're researching it. They're drafting and writing the policy. And then there's like a public comments phase. Public comments, yeah. Which what is, is, what, like, is that? What does it actually work at all? Or it's the, the regulator's nightmare. Um, and they'll like go. They don't. They don't want to hear from. The they public. don't want to hear from the public because it's a pain in their ass. Like totally. I don't know if I can curse on this podcast, but uh, you know, agencies don't like public comments because, and it's required by law for an agency whenever they promulgate a new regulation. Um, to uh, put out the reg for, for public comment. And they're basically saying like, hey, here's what we're going to do public. If you have any feedback, let us know. And sometimes an agency will get like two comments and that's it. But sometimes they'll get like hundreds of thousands, like the FCC net neutrality rule. And it can like completely break the system. And the agency has to like read all of those regular uh, comments, like respond to them. It's massively time I'd imagine you can just respond to all the ones that are the same with the same single response. Yeah, yeah. Like, there are a lot of like carbon copy comments. And this is like part of the tech that we're building to, you know, citizen engagement tooling for, for public comments on this site. Just help organize the, how many comments they got of what type and help respond. Yeah, and, and long term, like we want to, like I think actually the public comment period is very powerful and most businesses, especially smaller ones, don't know about Should it. Should there be more ways in which they have to engage if a lot of small businesses respond? It seems like that'd be a good process if a thousand small businesses say this is going to crush us. You can't, you'd want them to then have to go talk and delay it, right? Yeah, you would. Um, but I think that there, there's really no check on the agency to do that. So maybe there should be something in law that yeah, forces there has the to process. Be law better. for for that, and that's where regulatory reform comes into and so, play. So 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 you, the public responds. They review the response. Maybe they take action on the comments. Maybe they don't. They might they might change a few things. If, yeah. they, if they're a good regulator, they might say, "Oh, okay, we got to change." They might a change a few things. verbs. That's it. But yeah. you, but usually they usually they don't want to change anything at that point. They just they're forced to to pretend they're listening. Yeah. And then and then they publish the policy. They publish it, the policy. And then, and then they go and enforce it. They enforce it. And this is where the disconnect starts to happen. So the agency just spent, like each rulemaking takes about a year um, end to end at least uh, to you know, be promulgated. And after that, it goes into enforcement where the agency is actually administrating the regulation. And Sorry, it takes a year to be promulgated. It means it takes a year to like teach everyone what the new rule is. But promulgated uh, is just like a fancy um, government word basically for like creating a regulation. Okay, so it took a year to create it. Now it's published. Now it's published. It's like in effect, you know, people are like now abiding by the new regulation. Mm -hmm. And then there's no data on the ground being collected and fed back into this policy life cycle. So we just spent so much time creating this regulation. We put it out into the world. Then we're going to leave it and like go on to the next thing. Just assume we must. We're just geniuses and it must be perfect. It must be working. There we're, are no KPIs or any of that. Yes, whereas, whereas, whereas you know as a startup CEO, when you build something, you have to just constantly iterate to make it better. Yeah. But there's nothing like that for There's the nothing like that. Um, and the only reason they'll change the regulation is if the law changes their statutory authority or a really massive special interest like throws a fit. And I guess sometimes it'd be good if someone threw a fit if it was really broken. Oh, yeah. I think like throwing fits is like totally called for uh, in, these, in these cases. But 
I think that there needs to be like systematic uh, like data collection and, and you know review and this iteration. This is where technology innovation should be. This is where technology innovation should happen. So we're talking about challenges and problems in our society. The regulatory state, we've obviously it's not using data nearly as well as it could. It's not getting feedback and being more, being dynamic. Uh, what are what are some of the other ridiculous problems that you're seeing in the regulatory state? Well, I think you know from the outsider's perspective, when you think about government, you're like they they probably like have like sophisticated systems and are doing this like you know in a, in a you know very organized way. But typically, when Esper like starts you know working with an agency, they are making policy like on the fly using Excel spreadsheets, Word, like they don't have a single place of like record for all of their so the policy. Data, so, there, so there's millions of words of regulations and they're using Excel and Microsoft Word. They're not, there's nothing else there. Yeah, technology. yeah, or pen and paper. Um, pen and, and paper. So. Yeah, which is like anytime there's pen and paper, there's time for innovation. So there's a lot to do there. Uh, but it's kind of like they use like these Frankenstein like disjointed systems and try and make their, their policy work that way. But, you so know, has this evolved much in the last 50 years? Are they still doing things similar? It's really it really hasn't at all. And it but like the scale of policy has grown dramatically. And that's the issue, right? Like they have really, really outdated processes, but they're creating policy at a faster clip than ever. So like they need to have tools to actually. So the government this. hasn't gotten a lot smarter in the last fifty years, but they're managing a lot more. They're managing a lot more, yeah, and and so we needed to build an operating system to actually track and own the workflow through which policies are created, and that's what Esper does. So you need a comprehensive technological yeah. solution that, that helps them innovate and get feedback. In terms of the other problems, I, I remember hearing once you said there there are all sorts of outdated law uh, regulations they're enforcing because they're tied to laws, but they don't know they're tied to laws that are expired. Yeah, that seems pretty. That seems pretty crazy. It just is it because there's just been no technology to to to, to review this well, stuff. Yeah, it's like such a manual process to comb through. If I'm a regulator at the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality, um, I need to like read through my like three thousand regulations and go back and like fact check every single law that I cite. That's like a year long process for like a team of five people. Whereas whereas technology could theoretically do that yeah, right away. Yeah, Esper just like does that automatically. It's like from the get go, it's there. Um, Cause we've like already like linked all of the, the laws and the statutory authority and gone back and checked them. Like that's- So solution you're, crea- you're creating basically, uh, in computer science terms is called a graph of information where it's all connected. Yeah. And you have, you're calling it an operating system where the workflows of creating the regulations, reviewing the regulations can be tracked and transparent and collaborative. And, and, and no one else has done this? No. Well, it's because regulation is boring to people. Like, it's not a fun, like, dinner party topic, but it's so important. It's like the, and people talk about, you know, small business being the backbone of our economy. I actually think regulation is like the backbone of our economy, good or bad. Sometimes you have a bad back. Like, I think that there's a lot that needs to be worked on here. And I wish that were more, there were more people in the tech space working on the regulatory problems. And, and so, but, but by putting, by putting in this technology, you can make it more dynamic. You can hold them more accountable. How, how are you holding regulators more accountable? Yeah. So there are all sorts of checks within the software, um, that are like designed with the regulators. Like they know what they're getting into, but they also like want it, like they're buying in, they're opting in. So, you know, things have to go through like certain levels of approval. They have to do cost benefit analysis. They're comparing against other states. They're checking against federal law. Like there are all of these, you know, automated checks within the system of like, or is this on the right track? Are you doing what you should be doing here? Um, and if not, like here's a flag. So uh, the, the software does that automatically. And, and, and ultimately, if we're making the regulatory state work better, it's gonna be higher economic growth. It's gonna be more fair results for small businesses. Yeah, that's the long-term goal. We still have a lot to build. It's like, it's very early. We're a three years old company, but uh, I'm very optimistic. How many people are on the team at Esper? We have 32 people. Very two people, and, yeah. you're, and you're based in Austin, Texas. Proudly headquartered in Austin, Texas. Went to Texas before it was cool. And you, you told you me it was there, a bad idea. You were there well before. <laughs> you were there well before me. Yeah, we came in yeah. and we went there in 2018. Awesome. So the name of the show is American Optimist, and if there's one thing that frustrates a lot of people I know in the business and innovation world, it's the regulatory state and how it works. Why should Americans be optimistic about the regulatory state? Yeah. So I think that. COVID actually was a really great catalyst for a lot of regulatory change in a positive direction, and we're continuing to see that trend go go well. So you notice in, in, in the last year that a lot of like unnecessary regulations were just cut. Um, you know, you can now like take alcohol to go in Texas, or like lots of different things. Licensing reciprocity was like dramatically improved over the last year. So agencies had this big wake up call where they were like, oh, we need certain innovation to happen at a fast clip right now. We're going to take these regulations away and see what happens. And a lot of those regulations are staying off the books. And for the first time, you're putting technology into the processes that build and review these things. Yeah. Te- technology sounds like it's our friend here. It's, it's going to make this work It's definitely better. our friend. 
And when we think about what we want our government to look like 50 years from now, um, absolutely uh, technology is a huge part of that. And Esper is playing a part in it. Um, and we're going to continue to grow over the next several years. Well, thanks, Malika, for joining the show. Thank you. Thank you.